A new Australian film is now available digitally on various platforms, a film called Cherub Head. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer, director and lead actress of Cherub Head, mm -hmm. Sarah Legg. Uh, Sarah, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me. Now, this is quite an intriguing debut feature film for you that uh, very much is your creation. What was the inspiration behind you making the film? A really large inspiration for Cherub Head in terms of where the team was. We were quite young, straight out of high school. Um, we came out of high school in COVID times. It was 2021. So we were thrown right into, you know, depending on where you were, a lot of lockdowns. For WA, it was just very isolated. I was initially thinking of moving over east to Melbourne um, and those plans were obviously cancelled <laughs> due to what happened to the world. And so um, we really basically all of my plans have been shattered and we wanted to we had a year on our hands we didn't know what was really going to happen in the future but we wanted to make a mark we wanted to make something that would hopefully help people to notice us as emerging artists and to make a film that isn't just going to be your standard run-of-the-mill indie it's going to be something that's trying to trying to say something so it was very politically charged and I like just saying that it was in COVID times because that was a very politically charged time like lots was happening behind the scenes and that was almost kind of fuel to our creative engine in terms of actual thematic uh inspiration I dabbled in a little bit of philosophy and I was very interested in The Prince by Nicola Machiavelli which I read the first time in when I was 16 and I was very interested in his ideas and I loved this concept that you know critics were both and readers of his work were both calling him a pioneer of democracy and a an advocator for fascism at the same time <laughs> depending on how you interpreted some of his ideas. I thought I found that grey middle area to be quite intriguing. And the story is essentially about a young person who is thrown into this space where they are navigating that that grey area, that um, uh, that um, that space. And so Nicola Machiavelli is obviously the very large inspiration behind it, but um, Obviously, film, filmmakers, and um, I really love the work um, from now. I still need to figure out how to pronounce the name, but I know it's Celine Schiama. Schiama. <laughs> um, she's a really big influence. I love her work, um, especially Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Yep. Yes, Schiama is an a, a excellent filmmaker. Schiama. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yes, yes. So in fashioning the story of a, a group of young women uh, and the games that are played, uh, so to speak, um, uh, how easy was it for you to develop the screenplay so that you can direct it? Mm. I was very... When I wrote the script, I was, this was obviously my first time and I just had, I won't lie, I just had a lot of raw ambition and I didn't, you know, any anything that I wanted to convey, I thought, you know, we're going to we're gonna problem solve, we're going to get creative, we're going to figure out a way to convey it no matter what. And some of those things did come from script, um, but because we had such a fantastic team and the team was also with a lot of young people that had a lot of creativity and had a lot of ideas. Some of the really beautiful moments of this film came from our two leads, Angelina Curtis and Nicola Kinane. They both had a really great understanding of the story and the script and, you know, gave, I could, so I laid a bedrock as a, as a script writer does, but they added a lot of the details that I think make this film feel a lot more complex um, than what this script actually had so I don't give credit to the script I give quite a fair bit of credit to them um, and in regards to the script 
for me, it's very much a channel your intuition. And Cheruped was a very intuitive project. I had read the book several times, but in the end, I threw it to the wayside and I said, look, that can just be an inspiration. And whatever ideas you have, just follow them, play them out, see them through and see what characters you create from that. And that was a really, that was a really uh, rewarding exercise in the end. Okay. Now, I know the film was shot at your home, your homestead. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, what sort of uh, crew did you have in terms of shooting the film and how long did it take, all that sort of thing? Yeah, it was a very skeleton crew, I'll tell you that. Um, and it was, we had basically, I mean, it, it, like a lot of no-budget indie filmmaking, it's every person has five different roles and everyone just does what they can to make the film happen. Um, but I'm so grateful because we all we all got along really well and we really knuckled down with everything that was happening. Um, we had basically, I could count on two hands, the <laughs> amount of crew we had. It was very small. Um and so because of that, everyone played a really integral part. In terms of, so was our crew. Did you also, sorry, did you have a question in regards to the space? Uh, more about how long it took to shoot. Oh, how long it took, yeah. Um, originally we were just wanting that to be a month or two. Um, but obviously I think like midway through our shoot, that was well. And WA had its first lockdown for, it wasn't for long, it was only for about a week or so, but that, that totally threw us out. Um, I think overall it ended up being a four-month shoot in the end. But but the thing is we weren't, we were only shooting on weekends, so we didn't shoot during the week. We only shot on weekends. So if you tally that, it's probably actually maybe a bit less than what <laughs> um full-scale productions do so we but we made sure just to do it on weekends so that it was you know people could still live their lives and have some sort of feeling of sanity and normalcy <laughs> <laughs> fair enough how easy was it to shoot the film with you also being in the cast uh and directing it mm. and directing your uh, uh your fellow actors how did that all that work that was a really great question and I've learned from this film not to do that. <laughs> I um, I was originally an actor. I always wanted to be an actor. That was always the, the main goal and um, I, throughout my training, I realised that I was quite critical and I was quite analytical in my approach to acting and um, at when it came to Cheruped where I was directing and partially producing and acting there was this really strong conflict and disconnect where the directing required a lot of your analytical thinking it required a lot of critical thinking it required a lot of up here whereas acting required you to let you, you have your you have your analysis you have your critique but at as soon as the camera starts rolling, I personally need to just let go of that and I need to come into my my body and follow my intuition and react in the moment and have a certain amount of spontaneity, which I found very hard to balance and to go from, you know, thinking, thinking, thinking to suddenly forgetting about all that and acting, but then still silently thinking because you're directing the other actors. It just... <laughs> In the end, it became a little bit much. So, but it was, I, I'm really grateful for the experience. And what was wonderful was that Ange and Nicola actually had more acting experience than I did. Than I did. So in the end, they um, were very good at being able to, you know, give themselves notes, <clears throat> sorry, and improve um and improve by themselves but in the future I am exclusively writing and directing that was my one and only 
acting debut. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Now, why did you call the film Cherub Head? Mm. Um, good question. The film is about, in essence, losing your naivety and losing your innocence and realising what the world is like. And the film centres around Ellie, which is our young protagonist, and she's seen as, you know, exactly that. She's seen as naive. She's seen as, you know, something pure, something that has not been, you know, even though she is an orphan, so technically she would have gone through quite a lot. Um, she is seen as as this, you know, this angel. And that was the literary meaning behind the title. From an artistic perspective, to be completely honest with you, Peter, I liked the way it sounded. Mm. <laughs> and I loved... I loved the imagery of, I I don't know, I was kind of thinking like French Revolution, I was thinking guillotines, I was thinking beheadings, I was thinking revolts and revolution and change and something, you know, and a fall from grace. And that's where that sort of imagery and that sort of those ideas are where Cheruped came from. Okay. No, that's fair enough. And you even had Mm. a rat in the film. I did, yes, we did. <laughs> um, lovely, lovely Boris. We actually had, there's a funny story behind that. We had a rat planned for the shoot and then really unfortunately that rat passed away two days, two days before we were supposed to start shooting with it. So the final 48 hours before we started shooting was just this massive statewide hunt for a rat (laughs) and I'd go on to like the Facebook you know guinea pig rodent communities and I'd be like hey I'm making a little indie film does anyone have a (laughs) have a pet that they'd love to be in a film and (laughs) so went on went on to all of the groups and went on to some of the forums and then in the end we we managed to get we managed to get our rat and um they were absolutely amazing. Couldn't have couldn't have been happier with what we ended up getting. <laughs> That's great. Now, I'm sure that uh, new rat has a, a a great film career ahead of it. Um, oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, a, a, a lot of uh, the filmmaking process uh, is contained in the editing. Tell me about mm. that process. How did that work for you so that you could uh, uh, fashion the final version of the film? Well, we had uh, Cara Ribery as our editor and she was she was really wonderful. Um, she was, this was her first feature film as well, so we were all quite excited. I, we had, uh, it's kind of a, on the set you'll see, there's a door at the end of the hall and the whole idea is that that's Marie's room and you can't go in there because that's Marie's room. Um, That plot point came because that was actually our post-production room (laughs) and we hadn't decorated it and it wasn't part of the set. So we were like, it's Marie's room. You can't go in there. Um, But that's actually where we were going after we were filming to edit the film. So we, you kind of felt like you were living and breathing in that, in that corridor at that point. Um, And every day after set, we, you know, bring in the footage and we do the rushes, but I was so excited. I wouldn't even really look at the rushes. I'd get right into the edit suite and I'd start looking, well, I was looking at every take, but as the editor, I was I was already, you know, getting excited and getting ahead of myself and piecing together an assembly and such. And I mean, Cara didn't complain because, you know, assembly is sometimes not very fun. But we, from assembly, um, Cara came on board and she found, you know, really wonderful moments to be able to create tension 
Um, we also had Oscar Prosser who did the score and that was really a big part of the edit for us and I think really, you know, Kara and Oscar together really made the edit because the score had this kind of rhythm and momentum to it that really helped push the film along Um, because a lot of it's dialogue and a lot of it's just, you know, people sitting in rooms chatting to each other. So, you know, how do we make that interesting and engaging? And um, while I've come a long way from Cheruped, since Cheruped, what we managed to do and managed to create with the very sparse sparse amount of resources that we had um, is something that I'm always going to be quite proud of. Yes. No, congratulations on this <laughs> being your debut feature. That's uh, that's well done. And, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Now, the, the other aspect, of course, of making a film is having it seen. So... Uh, yes. How the has important it... part. <laughs> <laughs> so... Ha- how has it been seen? Has it been in festivals or whatever? And, of course, it's great that Bounty picked it up. Absolutely. So we, Matthew Eels, who runs Cinema Australia and also is the festival director of WA Made, reached out to me when our film was still in post-production. And he will be saying, hey, you know, I've heard of your film. It's on my radar. I'd love to have a look at it, have a look at it once, once you guys have a cut. So we sent it to to Matthew and um, we were really grateful and so happy that he loved it. And so he gave Cherub Head its world premiere at WA Main Film Festival, um, which was quite the experience again during COVID. So the I think it was the cinemas could only be at a quarter capacity. Um, it was either a quarter or a half, maybe it was half capacity. And we were supposed to only have one cinema, but Cherub had kept selling out. And so I know by the end, when we had our premiere, there were four cinemas that were <laughs> fully booked screening the film. And that was a, just a wonderful experience to have the premiere on home soil, like where we had, where we had, you know, all of the crew were there, all of the crew's family were there, all of the people who had been supporting the film from the sidelines, they were all in WA. This was a purely WA made film. Um, from there, I believe the order was that we went to, we were then nominated for Best Oceanic Film at the Septimius Awards. In Amsterdam, that was really incredible because it was my first experience to go overseas. Um, And we were nominated along with some really incredible films, including Apparitions, which was directed by um, uh, Cinema Viscera, um, Paul and Perry, and uh, I Am Woman by Anju Moon, which was the one that took the prize. But in all honesty, it was just incredible for our little, you know, $3,000 $3,000 film to be nominated alongside a film that had upwards of a $5 million budget. So I was chuffed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, that's that's where I, I met Paul and, and I met the Bounty team. And then after Septimius, we had our, set, our third screening at Revelation International Film Festival. That was really incredible. Um, because then, you know, I was able to meet, meet Jack and, and Richard and Richard Sawada, Jack Sargent, and um, Suzanne Warner, and I got to be a part of the beautiful Rev independent film community, which is so much bigger that you would, than you would think on first glance and spans the entire globe. And I was honestly just quite impressed that, um, you know, such a big operation would be in Perth. You wouldn't think it. But it's happening. <laughs> yes. And then finally, after that, we had um, Cheruped was nominated for uh, innovation in a feature film under a one million dollar budget at the WA Screen Culture Awards, and that was I think it was only in its second or third year then, um, but that was a wonderful way to just just end it off. Well, congratulations on all that. It's it's obviously got a great reception, and uh, yeah, that's a great experience for you and the team, and uh, uh, and everyone. Absolutely, we we got a lot of local love, which is, you know, at the end of the day, our our real goal was just for the industry to be able to see us, 
um, we're not just, you know, a group of students that have come out of university. We're also able to prove that we can deliver a film and we can make a film, you know, even with basically nothing, <laughs> we can still make it happen. And I think, I think a lot of the, the love and support for this film came from that understanding that we did it, did it from nothing. Um, and I think if you just looked at it, on its own you know it's just another indie film but with that with that story and with that with that context it's a it's a bit of a hurrah for young filmmakers it certainly is no well done on that it's um uh and it's now available on various platforms digital uh mm -hmm. etc which is which is fantastic yep. so sarah i'm quite intrigued what attracted you to working in the film world in the first place yeah, um, I still ask myself that, no. <laughs> the, what attracted me to film, I always loved film. From when I was very young, um, a lot of, I'm sure you've heard it from a lot of interviews, I was one of those people that always had a camera, always in front of the camera, always something to do with cameras. As I grew up, though, you know, I started questioning that, that that love and why do I love it? Why do I want to do this? I love storytelling. I, I love stories. I love performances and I love exploring the human condition. And when I was young, I gravitated towards theatre um, because that's, you know, all of those things. It's performance, it's story, it's, it's culture. And I did theatre for quite a bit. But the thing that I felt disheartened by in theatre, which I know, you know, theatre lovers love, is that you spend all these months rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and then you have your show, which is, you know, for however long it is, if you go on tour, it's for longer, but it could just be, you know, as simple as a couple of weeks performances. And once you've done those performances, that's it. It's never going to be seen by anyone else again. It was a special moment between you and the audience and um, it's going to stay there forever. But I didn't quite love like that. I really wanted to be, to tell stories that could last and stories that people could, people could watch and then live a few years of their life and then go back and watch again and have a new understanding of it, a different understanding of it than what they had the first time. And then, you know, go and live a few years again and then watch it again. And that's why, I, that's what I truly love about film. I love that it, it is something that is in essence immortal um, and has this longevity where you can keep going and watching it at different points in your life. You can leave it, but you know, it's always going to be there. And most importantly, it can be seen by so many more people. Um, theatre productions can be quite expensive. And I compared to going to the cinema and watching a film, and there have been so many performances that, you know, I haven't been able to watch because I have been in a financially, um, uh, uh, I've been in a financially uh, unsustainable situation. So... Whereas film, you know, it's waiting there for you. <laughs> you you know that you can, you know, buy those other things, you can save up, you can get it. It's going to be there. It's not going to go. And that the longevity of film is what I love most. Fair enough. Okay, well, well done on that. So I'm quite intrigued. Are you working on another film at the moment? Yes, we're currently in post-production as we speak. Ah. So my second film is called Honeymoon. And this has been done with a much larger budget <laughs> and with a really wonderful cast and crew. We have Chloe Hurst, who is from Melbourne, um, as, as our wonderful lead as June, um, and Mahesh Jadu as Eric um, as our two as our two roles, and we have the support of Halo Films, Akasha Media, Little Fort Productions, like Martin Films, Cinema Machine. Like it's almost as if Cherub had, you know, brought some interest to this little corner of the world. And so Honeymoon, we have all of this incredible, incredible support for the next one, which has already, you know, just completely 
um, it's, it's just been a really wonderful experience and it's been wonderful to be able to create with these people and to collaborate with these people and also to be able to get closer to executing the original vision, which is, you know, what all directors want at the end of the day. <laughs> so, yeah, that's currently in post-production and we're going to be releasing it next year, so keep your eyes peeled. I will. I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> it sounds- Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very interesting. Um, and uh, I always love asking this of all filmmakers, uh, Sarah, have you seen any films recently or television series, whatever, that impressed you? Well, I just saw Megalopolis. Ah. That was, that was a very, I was very impressed by that film. Um, and actually... So I really felt like I I saw a lot of Francis's vision more than I have actually in any, any of his other work. Um, and what's another one that I've seen recently? Oh, um, what's it called? It's a French film. I think it was Le Fleur. Something about flowers in a field <laughs> was a 1960s French film um, from SBS. Flowers, it was, it was Le Fleur. Um, God, I've got to remember the the name. Sorry. It's a classic. It's a classic. I can't believe I've forgotten it. But you know what? I really loved that film as well. It was about a a um, a rose farmer who really wants the neighbor's plot of land because the neighbor's plot of land has this spring that's underneath the uh-huh. property and has all this water. And so they deliberately block the water supply and try to sabotage the owner of the neighbor's farm so that they can have all the water to themselves. Loved it. Wonderful film. That really impressed me as well. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. And uh, certainly uh, Cherub Head, which is now on release, courtesy of Bounty on various platforms and digitally, um, is certainly worth seeing as well. And uh, it's been my pleasure to speak to the writer, director and uh, lead actress of uh, Cherub Head, Sarah Legg. Uh, Sarah, thank Thank you so much. Great to talk to you. So wonderful to talk to you as well. Okay. All the best. Bye-bye.